Hi, everyone, and um, thanks for the very kind invitation. Um, I, uh, so as, as Amy said, um, the plan is to, um, to give some insights about Ferris software. And um, I'll try to be a bit more specific about Ferris software, because um, in my mind, sort of, let's, let's go a bit deeper there. Um, and um, before we start, uh, I, I want to, to highlight this sort of a comment that I, I, I really take to heart. Um, I, uh, there's a lot of focus on, on fair data, um, especially if you look at uh, different funding opportunities in, in, in recent years, uh, policies as well. But um, I'm very in favor of, the, of this quote that says that um, data implies software because it doesn't make sense to, to sit around a horde of really well done data, but don't really have anything to do with them. So not lacking the tools to actually do something with this um, really awesome data. So um, this leads me to a point that if you look at, at, at software, especially over the past 10, 15 years, even possibly more, um, research really, really relies on, on software. And, and I'm using here um, a, a study done by SSI just a few years ago, um, the Software Center Sustainability Institute in the UK about um, their reliance on, on software. So you can see that 92% of the research community um, regularly uses uh, this software and almost 70% would not be possible to do their actual work without the software if the software was not available. So software is actually a key part. At the same time, if you look at the, at the researcher um, as an individual, um, at this stage at least, um, they need to worry about how to deal with data, how to ensure that their data is collected, collected appropriately, it's fair um, to actually do the analysis, occasionally, if not always develop the software to do that, ensure that the software um, and all the research is reproducible, ensure that this can be done in, in fruitful collaborations, and this is just the top of the iceberg if you don't want to go more into depth. So, the idea here is to remove basically one of the things to worry about, and in my mind would be to, um, to, to resolve the software aspects. Uh, so as I said, this software is pretty much everywhere. So if you look at any particular point in this life cycle, you have um, software there from the data generation to how to do the analysis, how to do the publication, um, to do the research planning, all those imply in some sense, some software um, that, that takes place. But, and here where the fair aspects come in, um, research software cannot be as easily um, addressed um, as data. So if you take the fair principles, um, you cannot consider that software is basically data and sort of apply them as they are. They do have some similarities. And one of them being that either neither are commonly cited. So this is one thing to, to bear in mind, uh, but both data and software have multiple versions. Uh, both have licenses. I have a question mark there because I will be addressing this shortly in terms of similarities. And um, they have something that they are sort of fairly similar in the sense that um, both can be used as the basis for several other things to, to be built on top. Um, they have some big reliance on existing hardware, software, and so forth. But there we have also a lot of differences. So if you look at the, at the, at the dependencies only, um, data is much more straightforward in terms of dependencies and uh, software usually have a much larger and more complex set of dependencies to, to, to deal with. Um, and when you talk about reuse, um, if you start addressing this for software, um, then we have a whole different set of R's to deal with, like rerun, reuse, re-execute, repeat, reproduce, extend. So all those are different parts of the reuse term, if you want to, to go that way. And finally, as opposed to, to data, um, research software tends to be used more efficiently in terms of workflows. So you have piece of software that sort of um, fall one after the other. So what we did is um, just a, a year ago or a couple of years ago, um, we started working on how to reinvestigate or re-identify the FAIR principles for, for software. Um, we started with a um, definition of software being um, something that is used to generate, process, or analyze the results that you intend to obtain in a publication which in my mind has a big question mark on the side, but well, it's something that 
basically everyone can sort of agree with as a baseline. But then we have many forms, many purposes, many distribution channels. So there's a whole different set of things to, to discuss. But, and, and now we'll connect also to one of the earlier points that was raised in, in today's call. Um, traditionally, research software is often created as a, an open source software. So it's, it has a very clear overlap um, with um, FOSS, but at the same time, when you're doing with FAIR, you don't, do not necessarily imply that it's, 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 it's free and open source. Um, so there is one decision to, to bear in mind. Ideally, we want everything to be uh, free and open source, but at the same time, the FAIR principles per se do not imply this, this particular aspect. So um, for the next couple of slides, I'll really, really go um, uh, fast through the um, different FAIR principles as the suggestion is to reassess them for, uh, for research software. So if you go for findability, on the top, I have the original principles, and if you look them up, and then you have what is happening to the software case. So um, when you're talking about findability, uh, the metadata are mainly applicable to, to themselves. It's, it's in that context, but the software identi identification can be both intrinsic and, 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 and external. So how to connect them with, uh, with external um, databases, external re registries. And again, when dealing with registries and how you want your resource to be findable, um, and I will move away from the GitHub and only focus on, on the metadata themselves. Um, you need to consider how that there are specialized registries. So there are some that are very specific for research software in even for particular domains. And there is no one cuts all um, registry that you can, we can use in, in this context. And you need to be aware of that. Um, also, if you talk about um, describing with rich metadata, you're in, 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 in software, you, usually um, you, I mean, you, you often use semantic versioning. So there is an intrinsic description of, of how um, this is uh, described. Um, the accessibility part is roughly the same for both data and research software. There are minor um, technicalities to be addressed, but largely um, because the accessibility is relying on the metadata in particular, it's easy enough to, to, to implement and to completely transfer to software. Um, moving to the interoperability, the reusability, reusability sorry. Um, this is where things come a bit more complex. Uh, for interoperability, for data, the, the main concept is to use, um, uh, to use the, the common vocabularies and have the references to other metadata. Um, however, when we are talking about interoperability for software, um, these points can be easily addressed, but when you're talking about interoperable software, so software that can sort of interoperate, what does it imply? Are we talking about how to connect different pieces of the software to each other? Or are we talking on how the data that goes into the software um, reflect on that? Are we talking about standard for data then? So there is a, a, a bit of a gray area there on how you need to define um, the interoperability. And we had some suggestions in, in that context as well. Same with the reusability. So we are talking about um, having rich metadata for if you're talking for data and, and, and licensing and detailed provenance. Um, so for sure, we're talking about dependencies and licenses for software. This is absolutely critical to, to include in order to be uh, reusable. Uh, but at the same time, you might also need documentation. Um, what are the use cases that do exist? How, how can we ensure that you can actually reuse something? It's not just a piece of code that has a license and a, 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 a releasing of the dependencies. And finally, as I said before, reusability is a rather broad term when we talk about software. We talk about rerun or reuse or reproduce. So what is the R part? And occasionally you might have come across fair R, 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 R or different ranges so far in, in literature trying to address exactly this particular case. Um, so this is sort of a first attempt that happened again, as I said, about a year ago. It was an attempt to interpret the fair principles as they are right now, but for software. But I'm, I'm very happy to say that there is a very strong drive across multiple different organizations, initiatives at all different levels of ensuring that software is sort of make a first class citizen in research and apply all those principles in practice and through policies. I'm listing just a couple of, of the most 
um, relevant ones. Um, it's, I want to particularly highlight two efforts. One is that was done in the context of RDA um, through this pandemic and um, the particular recommendations and guidelines that came out through the um, research software sharing subgroup. Um, they have a clear alignment with the FAIR principles, but mostly they aim to give very practical and very precise instructions on how you can ensure that research software can be shared effectively um, and with I ideally minimal effort from the digital researchers. And the second point is that um, just a few days ago, um, the EU published this um, sort of six recommendations for implementation for practice, which actually did include all those, um, both the fair principles that I mentioned before, uh, the best practices that Elixir is, is working on and uh, the software um, release software guidelines that were produced by the RDA. I have one last point to raise. So, um, all is well, so we have about, we, we know about the four principles. Um, we kind of know somehow, if we put really effort on them, how to apply them, hopefully. Uh, but if you look at the individual level, so what I can do to help, um, the, this is where we go with the best practices. So in most cases, as I said at the beginning, um, researchers tend to develop their own software. And the reason is that they, they have, clear knowledge of what they're trying to do. They are basically the experts in their domain. And um, if, you, if you would like to have a, an expert actually writing the software, software engineer, uh, it's not easy to find. And even if you find them, it's not really um, affordable, especially for, for small groups. So basically 90% of the people, <coughs> of researchers are actually self-taught in writing their own software because this is what they need to do, which lead to low software quality and not really good sustainability of, of the software itself. So the best practices, and again, an example here is from Elixir where I was involved and I can sort of recommend in that sense, um, are some really straightforward ideas that you can apply at all times to ensure that both your um, software aligns fairly well to the fair principles as were identified before, as well as the open science principles. So there's, they, they aim directly at this particular overlap between fair and FOSS. So one step at a time, what can each of us do to like aim for that? As I said, the four SS, these are actually the four principles, make the source code public available from day one, make the source, uh, the, the software easy to find um, by offering metadata and registering to something that you know people are knowledge of, if they have the knowledge of and they can find. Uh, always find a license and adopt one that is ideally um, permissive and always in line with any third party dependencies that we have for your software. And if you want to um, build a community around it, um, define how people can actually help you with the software and sort of engage with them. Mm -hmm. A second point is to utilize software balance plan, which is something that is emerging. Um, and in some cases, like in the UK, they are sort of established in, in funding schemes, uh, which is mostly an awareness tool so how to ensure that all those aspects are covered and you sort of give some effort in thinking about them in the first place. And finally, of course, be part of the community and sort of be part of the discussion. And um, by just being here, I think you're sort of doing that already. And with that, I really thank you. I hope I did not take too much of the time. And if there are any questions, I'm more than happy to address them.